All right. So today we're going to be exploring many different ways that AI has an impact on what it is we're doing. And one of the things that I find super interesting is that a lot of folks get really surprised at what artificial intelligence is. They're not able to really take advantage of it. And so today we're going to take a look at a bunch of cool stuff. So I'm going to switch on over here to Adobe Bridge. And I think you guys are all seeing that. And I'm just going to use Bridge as a way to browse and locate images as we're working today. So I pulled a bunch of different files together. You can access Bridge in Photoshop by choosing File, Browse in Bridge. And this is kind of a cool way to have a file browser so you can quickly navigate and get access to what it is you're hoping to accomplish. So like I said, we've got a bunch of images here today. And I want to explore some of the different ways that these can be put together to enhance things. So let's start with something simple here. And what I'm going to do is just open up some images that have skies. And we're going to start with a raw file. So I'm going to take a normal raw file and start by opening this up in Adobe Camera Raw, which is what most of you would do if you were taking in Photoshop. And there's nothing wrong with this workflow. In fact, I love some of the perspective corrections in Camera Raw. But if I recover the highlights here and lift the shadows, it really only goes so far. And that's because the single RAW file has a lot of information, but there's only so much that you can do. So as you can see here, we can sit with this and start to lift the exposure and play with contrast. And it's pretty good. Don't get me wrong, a raw file has a lot of information in it, but I wanna show you a slightly different approach before that. So one of the things I like to do is take advantage of Aurora HDR. And a lot of folks think of HDR as being brackets, which is a workflow we'll talk about later, but it also works on single raw files. And that's because the raw file has the ability to show multiple exposures within it. So by pre-processing my image with Aurora HDR, before I start in Photoshop, I have the ability to reach inside the RAW file and basically do a super develop. Think of it as the ultimate in shadows and highlights recovery. It goes in, pulls out every single detail in the highlights and every single detail in the shadows and everything in between. And then it uses artificial intelligence to mask all of those good bits together into a great base exposure. And so this really simplifies things so you don't have to spend as much time tweaking the raw file or trying to find the best exposure with layers and masking and painting and blending. Now, the process takes about a minute, but when it's done, as you see, it pulled out everything good from every single pixel at every single bit of dynamic range there for that image. And so it was able to find a tremendous amount of detail. This is where the raw file started. This is where it ended it up. Now, just using HDR Basic, I could do Smart Tone, and Smart Tone has the ability to adjust exposure without shifting color. Normally, you might recall that as you adjust exposure and you make an image brighter, it gets desaturated, or darker, it gets more saturated. But with Smart Tone, you could tweak exposure with no color shift. So now I'm just going to send this and open it up in Photoshop. So I just jumped from Bridge to Aurora to use it as a raw developer. And now I can send that over to Photoshop and it's going to hand off the file and pass it on to Photoshop ready to use. And you see it handed off a 16-bit file ready to edit. So now I got the advantage there of pulling out every bit of detail in that RAW file. And before I do anything else, I'm gonna take advantage of Camera Raw. Let's just make this a smart filter. And now the layer can use filters non-destructively. That's not artificial intelligence, that's just intelligent. And what you do there is it's gonna create that as a smart object. And then we can start to apply filters to it. Now, come on, Photoshop, it's thinking for a second. There we go. Now, I'm going to run Camera Raw as a filter. So this isn't the same Camera Raw that 
develops the image, but it's all the same controls that you're used to when you open up a RAW file. So I can see that my shadows are just a tad clipped. And so coming down here into the blacks, I can lift those ever so slightly and lift my shadows. And that helps recover. A little bit of black is okay. But looking at these two indicators helps me understand if there were any clipping. So if I were to boost the white and it got too far, I would see that by the red pixels for burnt pixels or the blue pixels for frozen pixels. And at this point, I can safely say I have achieved the maximum dynamic range in this photograph, which is a great place to start. I've got as much detail as possible before I've done really any major work in Photoshop. So this was super helpful. And then you could take advantage of things like the free transform tool, which can allow you to do a uh, perspective correction if you had it, or you wanted to do any other sort of adjustment there. So the auto upright just fixed the horizon line for me and auto cropped the image, which made it great as an easy way to straighten the photograph. Plus, if we go on back to our regular tools here, I'm gonna switch over to sharpening. And my favorite trick here is to hold down the option or the alt key. So now as you drag the masking slider, you'll see the edges of what's being sharpened. So I could be super specific, find just the edges of the rock and not the sky and sharpen the heck out of them. And so now I can get a super sharp detailed image, but I don't have to worry about noise and everything is tack sharp through the photo. Our rock textures and sky are crystal clear and it's super easy. I hit okay and now in my mind, the photo is done. I've got the best dynamic range. I've got a straight level image. I've got maximum contrast and great color, and I'm ready to save and share this. So that's just a different way of working, but I wanted to show you how you have a different workflow for developing raw files if you wanna try it. And that is Aurora HDR. But in this case, it's not really an HDR image because we didn't take brackets. Rather, it's an expanded dynamic range image. It converts your 12 or 14 bit raw file temporarily into 32 bit color, which is just a crazy amount of detail. And then you generate a high quality 16 bit file and kick it to Photoshop like I just did here. Super easy and a great way to get the most out of a single file. All right, let me just go ahead and save that. I'm very happy with how that turned out. So I'll save that as a TIFF file. There we go and capture that so I've got it for later if needed. Perfect. All right, let's go back to Bridge now and tackle a slightly different example. And I wanna show you how we can pull out details again. So in this case, I'm gonna do that workflow one more time, but this was shot on an iPhone. A lot of folks don't realize that you can switch your iPhone to capture in DNG and a whole bunch of Android apps also shoot DNG. In this particular case, I shot this using uh, the Lightroom app that's available for iOS, and it's also available for Android. So by capturing this as a DNG file, it's gonna pull out a crazy amount of information. So what's happening here and why this is artificial intelligence is Aurora looks at the raw file, develops it a bunch of different ways, and then automatically generates masks and recomposites the image together. Now let's push it a little bit. I'm gonna take advantage of Smart Tone here, get the exposure that I want and a little boost in contrast. And now let's do a few intelligent color adjustments here. We'll do color contrast, which puts color into the areas that lack contrast. And so instead of a global boost to saturation or vibrancy, this is an intelligent boost to color and it adds color to the areas that needs it most. If I do a little bit of HDR enhance, I can add some smart structure. And this is gonna bring out texture there in the areas that again, need it the most, like the clouds. I love that. And let's just apply a simple uh, top to bottom lighting here using my adjustable gradient. I'll set the orientation, create a blend on the sky. It looks good and we'll just pull down the exposure at the top a little bit with a slight warming for the sky. And on the bottom, we'll lift that a little bit, but make that feel cooler for the pavement. 
looks great. Here's my, I'm real happy with it. Here's the before. Again, a single image captured on an iPhone has that much detail when you shoot raw. And now we can kick that on over to Photoshop and it hands off a high quality 16-bit file. I think a lot of folks don't fully realize that they have so much information that their camera sees that they never don't. And look, now that it handed it off, it opened it up in camera raw for me. So I could again, come on over to sharpening, hold on that option key to define the mask, and then feel free to sharpen the heck out of the image to get the type of detail that I want. If I want here, we can add a stylistic vignette and feather that a little bit for a gradual transition at the edges. That looks better. And I'm gonna do just to ever so slightly lift the shadows there. That looks good. And open that up. And now I am free to continue. But just for comparison sakes, let's bring in that original file so you can see it. So I'm just gonna open that up directly here in Photoshop. And I want you to see the difference between the two. So this is what you get on its own. And this is what you get when you take the time to process it the right way. And I'm hoping that you all agree that the sky that wasn't that great of a sunset, at least to the JPEG in the camera, well, I saw this detail in my eye and I knew with just a little bit of love and massage that I can get that incredible sunset. Because I was inside, I was here in California visiting my father and we were eating burritos at a dinner <laughs> and I looked outside and saw this sunset and I said, excuse me for a moment, but I didn't have time to go pull my camera out of the trunk. I stepped away from the family for literally 30 seconds, fired off this shot and just knew that it was waiting for me on my camera roll, ready for developing. Okay, I hope you guys are excited by that way of using what I like to call expanded dynamic range photography to pull out more details. Let's just take a quick look here in the comments and see. Uh, it says here, iPhones from six onward can shoot raw. That's right. And I'm glad that you guys have it that, set that way. Uh, it is a DNG file and Android phones do the same. So you may have to download a third party app in order to access this, but it is such a great way to shoot on your smartphones. Because after all, I'm sure you would rather have images that look a little bit more like this than this. So as you know, RAW is king. JPEG is for delivery, not for editing. All right, let's close this file and go to something else. So we'll go back here to Bridge and uh, let's explore a different example here of something that we can fix. And so I want to work with a JPEG for a moment and talk about some quick fixes that we can do. So let's just bring this in to Photoshop for a second. There we go. And this is a photograph by a professional photographer. It was one that was given to me to do a little bit of enhancement on. And I really like the subject, but I don't feel that she's separated as much from the background. So we have some cool tools here in Photoshop, like select and mask, and this works well, or select subject. And a lot of people don't realize just how cool this is. What it can do is actually find someone for you. Now to repeat there, I did nothing other than say select subject and Photoshop did the hard work. It said, well, let's see, this is in focus. This is probably the person cool. And it found it. Now, to make sure that this is perfect, I'm gonna click select and mask. And I say, oh, almost perfect. Well, now what we have is the ability to enhance a bit. So if I grab this, I can actually start to paint and let's just get a bigger brush there. And this allows you to paint on the subject there and start to build up that selection. If you take the eraser tool here, it will subtract it or let me just undo here for a second. I'll try the refine brush and just get a bigger brush, right bracket, typical Photoshop tool there. And now you could paint over that hairline and you see it starts to find the edges of the hair. So by painting on that, you can get some of those little wisps or things that might be missing. Plus, I like to do smart radius here. Again, letting Photoshop do the hard thinking for me. 
And as I increase that there, it starts to look around the subject and find the hair in the edges. So now I'll click OK. And to save that, I'll just go under Channels and Save Selection, and we'll call that Woman. Perfect. So this makes it easier later to come back to that channel to use it for things. Now I've got it stored as a selection. Let's do a little bit of enhancement here. We'll start with the global image. And one of my favorite adjustments here inside of Luminar is this adjustment called Accent AI. And what it's designed to do is to make it super easy to adjust colors, contrast, saturation, and everything with a single slider. So Luminar offers a simple workspace called Quick and Awesome. And you can see here, with a single slider, it automatically detects areas like skin tones versus vegetation. So the background got more detailed and richer, but her skin tones didn't get crunchy, which I like. Put a little touch of clarity in, and I like where that's going, and I'll just click Apply. Now what that does is lifts her and really gives some great color and punch to our subject. But I want to go a step further. So you might remember that we made a selection earlier. So what I'm going to do is load that selection and press Command or Control J to cut her onto her own layer. So now she's extracted. Now in the background, we're going to refine this a bit. What I'm going to do is adjust this. And so using my blur gallery, I'm going to take advantage of a few different blurs here. There's a blur called a field blur, for example, which is quite cool. And a lot of folks aren't familiar with this one, but I really like it. It allows you to add blurring using pinpoints. So I could just click and add a point and it's gonna to start to blur. And I could add, there's that first point and I'll say blur that and I'll put another one down here and since this is the foreground, I'm gonna say a little less blur. There we go. More blur in the background, a little less blur in the foreground. And this is super cool because you can dial in the amount of blur that you want. And I'll click okay. And remember though, we cut our subject out to our own layer. So we just recomposite her right on top. And now we were able to selectively blur the background, more for the stuff that was further away and less for what was close. And I think you agree that compared to crazy methods like calculations or the tragic wand, that select subject command combined with the uh, refine edge or the select and mask command made it super easy to composite her and bring her out of her own background. Plus, since this is on its own layer, we can all day long take advantage of things like a simple curves adjustment. Remember the great on image tool here? And just click and it correctly targets the curve so we can darken that backdrop so that it falls off a little bit more behind her. And now I've got the picture that I want. Super easy, even from a JPEG. So Photoshop makes it easy to latch onto some of that stuff and really bring it out and then using the Accent AI plugin, I was able just to really sharpen and bring out her color in a single operation. Rather than having to run 10 filters and numerous steps, I was able to do that with just one filter, saving time and effort. Okay, so I'm just taking a look here in the comments. If anybody else has additional comments, feel free to put things in there. And I'm glad at least one person appreciates the tragic wand. <laughs> we'll go on to another example here. And uh, I'm just trying to show you some of the cool ways that things can save you time. So let's do something here with an aerial image. And what I want to do is stitch together an aerial panorama and show you a couple of cool things. So first up, what I'm going to do is select these and open them up inside of Camera Raw. So Camera Raw has the ability to stitch everything together. And so this is easy. We'll just reset the color and clarity here. There we go. And select all and sync. And the reason why I do this is I want to remove any sort of color or exposure adjustments so I don't see seams. Now, built into Camera Raw, 
you have the ability to merge HDRs or merge panoramas. And this creates a whole new DNG file. So what I had here was just an aerial camera and I wanted to stitch that together. And that's great, I like it. I could either do an auto crop if I want or not. And there's even this great option here called boundary warp, which starts to pull the edges so you don't have to crop as much. So if it's just a real organic texture like it is there, boundary warp stretches things so you avoid it. And now I'll click merge. And it's gonna make a brand new file. So there it is, and it saves it. You can see the progress there, it's done. And I'll click done. Now you might be saying, well, why didn't you just take that into Photoshop? Well, that's because I wanna take advantage of something amazing inside of Luminar 3. So Luminar makes it easy to open up individual images and you can send something to Luminar first, or if you want, you could take it into Photoshop too. But I'm just gonna hand this off. There it is. And I open this up in the quick edit mode. And now once it's there and it successfully decodes, it takes a second to read in all the raw data. Cause again, this is like five DNG files. What I can do here is once this decode is ready, I can start to enhance it. So I'm gonna use a aerial workspace. And this is basically every filter I need for aerial photography. First, Accent AI. And I think we all agree that that was pretty fast and pretty easy. Then AI Sky Enhancer, which automatically finds the sky and sharpens, does color, and removes color cast in the clouds. Well, where I started, where I ended up. Pretty good, pretty fast. Now I'm going to take advantage of another filter that also uses AI called Foliage Enhancer. And it automatically finds the vegetation and lets me shift the color slightly. So I have a nice rich forest color now. And I like that before, after. Easy target, worked well. I'm just gonna do a little less amount. Add in some golden hour to fill in the sunlight. And let's do top and bottom lighting, set orientation here. And this lets me adjust the top versus the bottom. And I'm gonna say, slightly pull down the top and lift the bottom. Great, done and open in Photoshop. So what I've done here is I've introduced artificial intelligence. Now you can run these as filters after you open up the image in Photoshop, but when you pass the DNG or the raw file through Luminar or Aurora first, you're giving it more information to use. And now I could take advantage of Photoshop for great tools like content aware and stitching and filling and removing things. Cause there's a couple of distractions in this image that I don't want. So now I've got it open in Photoshop and I could just come on in and say, let's get rid of some of these things that are distracting like this little stop sign here. I'll press and select my, let's just bring up the toolbar here really quick window and there we go, tools. I'll just drop this up here so we see it. And we'll just take the healing brush. I'll actually be lazy and use the spot healing brush. Zoom on in, smaller brush, and paint a little bit. Let it do some content to wear fill. Take out the shadow, great. Remove this little sign, gone, nice and easy. And you see how simple it is to remove things from the picture you don't want. Not sure what this is, looks like a mistake. It's gone. By the way, when using these tools, sometimes follow the lines that are there and you get better results. That really helps. And if you haven't taken a look, you can actually deal with this here. There's different blend modes you can use, but I like to do the content aware option. And that just makes it super easy to remove blemishes or unwanted objects in the scene. And this was shot on a consumer quality drone, a drone that costs about $700. And as a great aerial landscape image, I'm so happy with the results I can get. And it just didn't take that much work. So this makes it fast and simple, and I can use the right tools to get the job done. So hopefully you guys like what you're seeing there. 
And uh, let's just see here if there's other questions. So cool. Uh, let's go here. Let's see. I love this. You've been quoted. Shoot raw JPEGs for delivery, not editing. <laughs> Feel free to use that. Yeah, JPEGs are great for the web and nothing else. <laughs> so let's take a look at another example here. But I hope you like that idea of panoramas. And I want to do something now to merge together a bunch of files to really get the maximum dynamic range. So I was on vacation up in Nantucket and I saw this awesome clock at a museum. And I just thought, oh, this will make a great image, but I wanna make an HDR first. So the HDR tools in Camera Raw are cool. They make a 16-bit HDR and 16 bits is a lot of information. Uh, the HDR tools in Aurora make a 32-bit file. So I like to go through there first because it just gives me more detail. But once I'm done, I'm gonna send it back through Photoshop's Camera Raw for sharpening and perspective. So here you see the full dynamic range. I just told the camera to auto bracket. Never a bad idea to choose auto alignment. In this case, I was hand holding the camera braced on the railing and I'll say create HDR. This is the typical example of HDR where you do auto bracketing in the camera and you tell it to automatically analyze and try to find the most detail and it shoots at different exposures. So essentially five raw files get merged into one super raw file. And so if you use things like shadows and highlights, you should be using HDR. Now, a lot of people hate HDR because all they've ever seen is crappy HDR. Puke up on the canvas, natural colors get turned into neon colors, and it just looks abysmal. But it doesn't have to. So the Quantum HDR engine, as well as the HDR engine inside of Lightroom and Camera Raw, both take a very natural approach. One's a 16-bit float, this one's a 32-bit image. So uh, sometimes I agree with the Best Buy methodology of bigger numbers means better pixels. And uh, this is the case. A 32-bit image does give you more dynamic range. Now, this takes just a second to open because it's doing a whole lot of math. But again, I'd rather take two minutes at the beginning of the process than spend 30 minutes fiddling with things as it comes in. So now it should be just about done. And it's going to show me a 32-bit image with maximum dynamic range. Once that's done, all I'm going to take advantage of is smart tone, a little bit of clarity, and the HDR details boost, and then I can hand it off to Photoshop to take advantage of all of the cool things in the Camera Raw filter, like perspective correction. All right, that's just about done. While that finishes here, let's just take a look here. Good, perfect. And final touches to make it awesome. Part of this is because I told it to align as well. So if you shoot on a tripod, your alignment's gonna run a lot faster. While that's going, let's open up one more thing into Photoshop. I'll let that finish up. And we'll just switch on over here to Bridge. And let's take a totally different example. And we'll just open up a portrait. Here we go. And I'm just going to open that up directly into Photoshop. Perfect. And let's see if it finished merging. It did. Great. Both things got done at the same time. That's how it always is. So this was one raw file, and this is the merge data. And I think you could agree that it looks photorealistic. It looks like I lugged a bunch of lighting equipment in and perfectly lit this because the blown out ceiling has come back. The front of the object has come back. So this was handheld HDR, and it really did a great job. Using the basic controls, I'll put a little bit of smart toning in to dial in the exposure I want and just a touch of contrast. There we go. That looks good. Not too much. And under HDR Enhance, a little bit of smart structure just further improves. Think of that as clarity. Structure is kind of like Clarity 2.0. Now I can send that back to Photoshop and it's gonna hand off a high quality 16-bit file. I understand why people think HDR is a bad word, but I use HDR photography half the time when I'm shooting. And the reason why is it's just impossible for the camera to see what the naked eye sees. And when I'm using it, 
It's not to produce artificial results. It's to get incredibly natural looking results like this. Let's go ahead and invoke Camera Raw as a filter now. So I can use all the awesome things in Camera Raw that I love. And we're gonna take a look at this. We've got just a tad bit of clipped whites there. So let's back those off ever so slightly. That looks good. A little recovery. That's fine. It's just a tiny spike. And now those whites aren't blown. Looks good. We'll do our sharpening. Crank that up and turn up the mask. And notice how the masking, holding down the option key, lets me define so just my edges are selected. Now I can sharpen like all get out and I don't have to be afraid of introducing noise or halos or artifacts. The key is getting the mask right. We'll come on over to the transform tool and a balanced transform should do the trick. A little aggressive. Let's try horizontal. That's good. Pure vertical, etc. But see, you can even draw your own. So now if I wanted to, I can just draw my own lines and say that should be vertical. And so should this. And it forces it. And I could say this should be horizontal. And you can start to define things. Now it looks crazy, but notice you don't have to go with the over the top. You can still use this here and tweak it yourself, adjust the scale, etc and take advantage of some of these ability to tweak the picture and move it into place. So if you felt like it was too strong, you could still introduce some of that angle back in and really draw that in the way that you want, allowing you to just fill in the picture and tweak it using upright. And so you see there, I was able to change that for less distortion. Now in this case, I'm fine with the distortion. I liked that we were looking up the object I'll just reset all of these here so it's not stretching the picture so much. And we'll just put those back to the default value. But Upright does give you the ability to draw your own horizon in vertical lines, and it will force the image to be correct. In this case, since we're obviously a low angle, I'm going to embrace that. But you could tweak it as you see fit. By the way, there is a really cool tool in here a lot of people don't know about. And this is the ability here for HSL. We have this tool over here and this is great. So watch, I could choose saturation and just click on the color I want and move the slider. And it targets that color. I could say, oh, you know what? I wanna bring out that golden color a little bit. And let's bring out the blue here and it grabs the right slider for me and moves it. Oh, you know what? I just wish that that sky was a little darker. Click and drag down. So again, no selections. Let the computer do the hard work. Why should you have to start creating crazy selections when you could just use this on image tool? Oh, the blue sky is not quite right. Roll the hue until it feels correct and you can dial it in. Don't like the green? Click on it and roll. And in this case, it's a combination of yellow and green, but I targeted it and got exactly what I wanted. So I think that's pretty powerful and a lot of folks really overlook some of these cool controls, but there we go. And I click okay. And I just wanna compare that picture. That's the end result. Let's open up and take a look at what one photo would have looked like from that. And so here was the base exposure. Let's just kick that into Photoshop directly so we can see a comparison. So if you would have shot this with one raw file and, or heaven forbid, a JPEG, this is what you would have gotten. But by taking advantage of more detail, I was able to pull out that much information into the file. So natural looking photos with detail are popular. Nobody says you have to make HDR garbage, just bring it out naturally. And that's really the advantage there of doing so. Plus, if you get into black and white photography, this great image here really works. I'm just gonna crank up the vibrance and I'm gonna add a black and white adjustment. And let's do that actually using the black and white. And you'll see the same on image tool. So now you can use this to mix the different channels 
and bring out the different colors separately. So like I could pull the green one way and the yellow the other way to really get some pop there. And I like that. But since I want this to look more filmic, add a lookup table for gosh sake. Now, Photoshop has a bunch of LUTs built in and you'll see different film stocks. And these are great. And what they allow you to do is to simulate some of the traditional looks of film by adding in a gamma curve and film emulation. And so this looks so much more like the black and white photographs I used to take versus just a simple black and white film conversion. And that's because I used to shoot a lot of Kodak film. So from there to there, by just taking advantage of the tools that you have in front of you. All right, uh, we're gonna talk more about LUTs a little bit later. LUTs are quite awesome, but uh, I'm gonna go on to one more example and then uh, we'll open it up for some more questions. And I wanna respect everyone's time, but I've got about 20 minutes left in the presentation and we'll keep trying to do some more. Color lookup tables though are totally your friend, everyone. You wanna take advantage of those because they really make it easy to give a great filmic look. All right, let's go back here and I'm just going to bridge to make it a little bit easier to navigate. And let's take a look at a different example. Uh, what I wanna show here is the idea of using that enhanced dynamic range. So here I have a sunset image and it's okay. And let me show you what that looks like if I try to boost things in camera raw. So if I bring up the shadows all the way and recover the highlights all the way, it's looking okay. I could bring in some exposure and some contrast and it's good. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a decent file that I could start with. But I'm gonna run that through the expanded dynamic range process we talked about earlier. And let's send that on over to Aurora. And we'll let it run. And I'll just say, create HDR and remove any noise. Great. While that's running, I'm gonna go back to Photoshop because I had promised you a cool skin retouch. So here we got a decent portrait. And what I just wanna do is bring out a little bit of detail in the skin and smooth some of the noise. So sorry for the noise there, guys. Uh, let me do this. I'm gonna take advantage of Photo Lemur. And Photo Lemur is an AI plugin that's great for batch processing shoots. So if you have a bunch of pictures that you need to process, you could drag a whole folder in there and it spits them out as a batch process. But what I'm gonna do here is use it to enhance the skin. So Photo Lemur automatically recognizes faces and eyes and skin tone, and it gives you a simple control. So it's not as robust and full featured as complex editing, but it's not designed to be. It's meant to be really fast and easy. So what we can see here, let me just maximize this, is there are controls for eye enlargement and face enhancement. And then using a simple slider, I just dial in where I want and click done, and we get a quick portrait fixer. So this is nice for a very natural fix to portraits. And the reason why you pop the eyes is a little bit is to just make them look a little more alert and open, and it makes the subject look very vibrant. So Photo Lemur does about 35 fixes to the image at once from color and contrast, and it's a more advanced version of Accent AI that you saw earlier, and that's because it just does more. So if we take a look at that there and it hands it off, there we go. You see, we got that nice little pop on the eyes. Now let's take a look at how Aurora was doing. And I think you agree that it found a lot of detail in that raw file. So now I'll just dial in that smart tone, get the exposure where I want, further recover things here with the highlights just slightly. We'll take advantage under color of color contrast, which looks great. And let's put a little bit of radiance in here. Just get a nice warm glow from that sun. I like that. We'll do a slight boost to the medium details. And let's take a look at the larger details there. That's good, brought out the detail in the sand. I like that. Adjustable gradient. We'll just define the top and the bottom of the picture. And I'll just put a little pull down on the sky and a little more lift to the beach. That's great. Warm up the beach, cool down the sky. I like it. 
and send it on over to Photoshop. There it goes. And I'm ready to continue working. Now in Photoshop, I can do the same things we talked about earlier, pulling out some of these little pieces of trash or driftwood on the beach that look distracting because they just look like black blobs. Pull out this little bump here. It's so simple to refine that. Plus, we can also explore those lookup tables to further enhance color. So let's just hand that off. There it is. And I'm going to take advantage of the spot healing brush. Just get a big brush. Paint, paint, paint. And it's so simple on things like this that are very organic in nature to pull out those blemishes and the little things that are distracting. Now I've got the type of shoreline that I want. Let's add the color lookup table. And while there's a bunch here, you can also load your own super easy. And so I have all sorts of files like this. You can download them off the internet. Uh, the folks over at Skylum have a whole bunch of these that you can also pull down for free on their website. So here's one. Uh, you see, actually, I've got hundreds here, but let me go and uh, grab some. And I'm going to grab one of my favorites called Faded Hipster, which is one that I made a while back. And uh, let me just jump on down to there. <laughs> I should have navigated directly to the folder, but as you can see, I like LUTs. And uh, LUTs are cool because they work both in film and video projects. And there's a ton of ones that you can get on the web that simulate actual film stocks. So that's what I have there is all these different types of film ones. So let's do the Faded Hipster there. And I'll click OK. And it's just doing this nice little fade. I like that. Or let's try doing a simple film stock emulation. And remember, you can always blend that if it's too strong. A slight boost there is just giving me exactly what I need. And now I've got that captured. Now, I've been talking about LUTs, but you might be wondering, well, how could you use them on your own? And here's something I want you to think about. So if you want to make your own LUTs, it's very simple. I just do this all the time and you can use any Photoshop adjustment layer. So these LUTs that you make will work in Luminar, will work with Aurora, will work in Photoshop, can be used in Lightroom. There's a little trick to apply them, can be used in Premiere Pro, Final Cut Pro, etc. So all you do is you take advantage of adjustment layers. So let's say I tack on hue saturation, grab the on image tool, target the color you want. There we go. And I'm going to say, let's make the blues a little more intense and a little brighter. And let's go after the skin tones here. And I'm going to pull that down right about there, but lighten it. I like that. And let's target the browns here and fill that in just a little bit with some more saturation. Now, if you didn't notice, it's been automatically masking and three different hue saturation adjustments are now contained in one HSL layer. A lot of people didn't know about that little trick. It's just right there. You could do all sorts of things with this HSL layer. Now let's add a black and white adjustment and do that same on image adjustment. Oh, hey, I want to lighten up the blues. I like that. Let's target the skin, make that a little darker. That's good. But I don't want that to be black and white. I'm just going to drop that into a mode like soft light there. So it acts like a bleach bypass layer of just punching the contrast. Cool. Let's do a little curve here. Same on image tool. Lift. Pop the whites. Crush the shadows. So if you have not used this tool before, it's there for a reason. It's to make all of these adjustment layers so much more fast and simple. And you can do all the sorts of things you might be thinking about. Let's toss on a simple film look here. And I'll do crisp warm and back the strength off. There we go. And now file, export, color lookup table. And everything, as long as your background layer is a locked background, every adjustment layer will get encapsulated 
into a single LUT file. So now I could just call this warm bleached. Hit OK. It's going to save that out. And there it did. I should have called it warmed bleached is there as well. So let me just go ahead and rename that. That's OK. I'll find it. Here we go. And let's just call that warm bleach. Perfect. If I could spell correctly. And let's go back to one of our earlier examples. Add that in. And load that LUT. Warm bleach. And now that color treatment where the strong contrast and the warming and bleached out tones is mapped to my new photograph. There it is. Warm bleach. And you see it applies that look. And since it's an adjustment layer, you can dial in the opacity for the intensity of the effect. But this allows you to take what used to take five or six adjustment layers with blending modes and everything else intact. And here's a good technical term for the day, concatenate, which is basically the scientific way of saying rolls it all up into one process and it gets bundled into the lookup table so you can easily use that on an image as a single adjustment layer in effect, speeding up your process and allowing you to essentially make adjustment presets. So instead of having to do actions, you could just store multiple adjustments into one LUT and then apply it to your footage for a creative look or a fix. And that's where that film stock emulation and everything else can kick in. So hopefully that makes sense. Let's do one or two more things. And I wanna show you something super complex, but it's gonna put a lot of these things together. So I've started getting into VR photography lately. I've always done panoramic photography, but I've started exploring what I could do with VR. And that's cool, right? VR allows us to see things and start to look around. And so in this case, you know, I've got some VR pictures of some caverns. And if we take a look at this here in a natural sort of view, you see we can look around and see where we were at, which works. And in the camera, I was able to shoot a bracketed mode. So essentially, I just shot three exposures and I've already spit those out into three JPEGs. Well, a lot of folks don't realize that if you are insistent, you can right click on those in Bridge and force JPEGs to open into Camera Raw. And so now that you have that, you can select all of those and merge those together into a new HDR and it will make a DNG file and it will combine those into one DNG. And I've already done that merge, so I'll skip this step. Or if you wanted, you could actually open those up and tell those to get merged with Aurora HDR. Doesn't matter to me. They both do a pretty good job and very similar when you're working with JPEG files. But it's going to take those files and combine them. And you're looking at this image. It looks weird. It's because it is a panoramic spherical image that's a full 360 degree view of the scene. So what this does here is it opens it up and it's gonna find the most detail and try to combine that to show you the most image. So you could play with that as you see fit and take advantage of simple adjustments. Uh, but, oh, did I send that to the wrong place? I might have, let's see here. I tried sending that to Aurora. Let me do that one more time, sorry. Open with Aurora HDR. Okay, so now it should hand it off. All right, anyways, let's go back to that DNG example we made earlier, and I'm just gonna kick that right into Photoshop. So I'll open that with Camera Raw, and this is the one that I made using Camera Raw, and I can just tweak the contrast. I further recovered the highlights and played with the shadows, and I'm happy with it. So now I open that up, as an object and it hands it in and brings it into Photoshop, which is cool. And once it's in there, I could apply filters. So if I want to run Aurora HDR as a filter, I could do that. I can come down here and say Aurora HDR 2019, and it's going to attempt 
to further enhance the dynamic range of this 16-bit image. So it hands it off, looks at it, and I'll say create HDR. So this way, I started in Photoshop, used Adobe Camera Raw, and I took those results and ran them through Aurora basically as Intensify. Some of you might recall that uh, a company called MacFun had a product called Intensify, and it made it really easy to get cool details unlocked. Well, Aurora does the same thing. So if we look at the before and after, you see how it just filled in the shadows and brought out some more detail. We'll put in a little bit of smart structure there, and let's use that smart tone. I think you're seeing that the word smart basically means use this, and I'll click apply. And now it sends it all back into Photoshop and brings it in as an image. Now, what's cool is, is that Photoshop has recently added the ability to view this as an interactive panorama. So if you shoot these type of images using a VR camera, or a lot of times you could shoot these actually, it's built into things like the DJI Go app. You just say 3D, spherical panorama, new from layer. And what it's gonna do is wrap that and convert it into a actual spherical panorama. Now, this takes a second, but it's gonna kick it over and turn it into a, a sphere, I should say, not a cube, that you could pan and look around. And it's gonna simulate the 3D experience. Now, if you want that to go faster, you could have merged this uh, before you ran that command. That's usually a good idea, actually. I should have flattened it first. That speeds up Photoshop a bit. But this will make this an interactive experience, one that you could pan and tilt around. Then, when it's in that spherical image, you can use things like the tools. So notice here, I'm looking in that space. And I can actually see this, and it no longer looks crazy or distorted, right? So I like how that's looking. And so, if I wanted to, I could do something like the content aware brush here and paint over something and start to extract it. So that would allow you to pull that out. Now, if you need to, it takes a little bit longer here when you're dealing with filters and everything, but that would allow you to do healing and other brushing and that works great. When you're all done, you just say export panorama and it's gonna generate the file. And now, when you post that to Facebook, you actually get the cool Facebook 3D viewer and it's all enhanced. So you could do everything you're used to on Facebook when you upload a panorama or a VR and pan and tilt and look around it. That's because it actually is interactive and you get that full benefit. So just a cool advanced workflow of putting all these pieces together, but it means that this is actually an interactive image that people can explore. So if you've ever wondered how they make that, this is one of those ways. And it just gives you the ability to explore. This is a live 3D object in Photoshop. Hopefully that looks pretty cool to you all. All right, we got time for one more thing. And uh, if you guys have any questions, now's the time to ask them. I also know that Andrew posted a link to the two plugins, actually the three plugins I showed you today. So if you take advantage of that, uh, the group, the user group will get a little bit of extra money that it can use to help fund some of its activities. And I hope you guys enjoy those plugins. Uh, let's take a look here at an underwater photograph for a moment, because this is another type of photography that I often do. And I wanna show you how we can solve problems. So let's start, and I'm gonna send this through Aurora to begin with. And in this case, this is a DxO file. So this was captured on the little DxO1 that used to be a camera, it's still available for sale. They severely slashed the price because it was basically like the size of a mirrorless camera for your iPhone or your Android phone. Uh, what I like about it though, is it comes with a great underwater case. So it is so easy to shoot underwater photographs raw. And it really has a lot of detail in that file. So by pulling in this raw file and running it through the expanded dynamic range process, it is super easy to find more detail. So look at how the colors and the detail were just locked in. I really like that. And I'm gonna say smart tone. Looks great. 
And now we'll kick that over to Photoshop. So this really brought out more detail in the raw file. Now it hands it off and opens it up and let's apply camera raw as a filter. There we go. We're gonna first do the sharpening pass. There we go. Hold down the option key for mask to define the edges and then crank the heck out of sharpening because it's safe to get really aggressive because we've got such a great detailed mask. Now, I'm gonna use the eyedropper here and attempt to neutralize this. It was a little aggressive, so I'm just gonna split the difference. There we go. And that allows me to remove the color cast. I just use that eyedropper to help me target the general range. Looks good. Put a little contrast in. I like it. Let's do that HSL adjustment you learned earlier. Take advantage of the on image tool so that I can target the different colors here and just bring them out. We'll bring out those golds. I like it. Target the blue here. Looks good. And let's just pull the purple down slightly. And then using luminance, same thing. Brighter blues, richer golds. Brighten up the green and hit OK. And so now my literally $220 case included underwater camera that I use for scuba diving is getting me DSLR like results, but I don't have to worry about damaging it. And this is similar that you can do with an iPhone. The fact that these cameras can now shoot raw really goes a long way, but this is that DXO one camera with the waterproof case. And I'm about 60 feet underwater here. So this is cutting through all that clutter, all that silt and just bringing out the details. Great. Toss on the color lookup table and grab a film stock of your liking. And it just further completes the look, giving you that filmic classic look that you might be used to for a nice classic image. So all sorts of things that you can play with there. And I hope you guys like that. All right, well, this takes us to the end of the block here. If you guys have any questions or comments, feel free to toss them in. But uh, there's a lot that you can do with these guys. I hope you really like lookup tables, taking advantage of expanded dynamic range photography, whether it's a single raw file or actual brackets. I think that that's going to be a game changer for you guys. And I would really encourage you to download that trial for Aurora and see if you can't use that as part of your workflow. Uh, the artificial intelligence of Photo Lemur and Sky Enhancer is great for landscape photos. So these are just the things that save time. And for me, it's all about the end results. I like to get the type of pictures I want fast and simple. So I've got time for one last picture and I'm just gonna take a classic landscape photograph here. Let's do a windmill and we'll put all these pieces together. So we're gonna open those up and just run that through Aurora. Allow it to do the merge, looks great. I know I was on a tripod, so I don't have to worry about alignment. And do the plugins have some beginner training? Absolutely. Uh, there's tons of training on the Skylum website. I co-wrote the user manual, and uh, I actually have some video training that's both up there for free and for download, so you can explore those. And uh, if you just look, I've got a lot online. Also, folks like Benelli and Abba Shapiro have a bunch of free tutorials that they've produced. Uh, Jim Nix and Matt Seuss have great content. So. This stuff has been around before. So uh, it sounds like Andrew's gonna post some links to the tutorials for you. Uh, Luminar has 50 filters in it and some of them will be overlap with what you're already used to using, but those smart filters like Foliage Enhancer, Sky Enhancer, Accent AI, those just go so far. So I'm gonna do this one last example that pulls everything together and that's gonna be make the HDR, then we're gonna get the colors we want and then I'll show you lastly the black and white treatment. So that's great. And by the way, if you haven't tried it, if you're looking for lookup tables, just do a search for free LUTs or the cube files. There's so many out there. There's some for sale. There's some that are out there, but this is going to be great. And uh, oh yeah, Andrew pointed out, there is a lot of training on lynda.com as well. So you guys can uh, find some of my content there too. I do have a class on Aurora and I do have a class on Luminar. So 
feel free to take advantage of those. All right, so if I haven't convinced you that HDR is not a dirty word, uh, hopefully you'll add it to your workflow, whether you use it with brackets or without, but this new Quantum HDR engine, which is patent pending, isn't available in anywhere else except Aurora. It's actually a completely different under the hood way of doing HDR. And the reason why it looks so photorealistic is because it looks at each bracket and pulls out the details. So it finds the best parts from each exposure. And then I could just do a little bit of tone, take advantage of that intelligent color contrast for the areas that need it. And then if you want to give it a little bit, just a touch of clarity and structure really help. Still looks like a photograph, doesn't look like candy. Now we can go ahead and open that up in Photoshop if we want, hands it off. And I can invoke this and continue to work, or you can run, a, I could have run uh, a plugin here and ran Luminar right here inside. You'll see that Luminar can actually let you run other plugins inside of it, so can Aurora. But I handed that off to Photoshop. And now what I'm gonna do is take advantage of black and white conversion to get a really good black and white classic photograph. So here's the handoff. Let's pull out the distracting objects. Paint, gone. Picnic table, gone. Picnic table, gone. See, and so you have no reason to leave distractions in your photograph. Just paint them out. There we go, looks good. Car gone, blip gone. Totally happy. Now let's run Photoshop's camera raw filter. We'll take advantage of our sharpening controls. Masking tool, option key to drag, find the edges, crank the heck out of sharpness. Looks so much better. That looks good to me. I'll click OK. Now I'm going to run it through Luminar, which just has incredible landscape filters to make it fast. So I'll say Luminar 3. It runs as a plugin right inside of Photoshop, so you don't have to hand the file off. It invokes it, opens it into a new window. And a lot of the presets that actually come in Luminar, I co-wrote. So if you like them, I hope you find them useful. Let's just switch to the landscape category here. But if you need more presets, you just click get more presets at the bottom. And they've got all these black and white photographs and others. But here's the AI landscape preset. And so it's not so strong with a single slider. I could just back that off until I get the look that I want. That looks good to me. Click apply and send it back to Photoshop. And the color in the enhancements come through. Then we'll do the film conversion and black and white. Now I'm gonna actually show you a last trick and that is before you do the black and white conversion, apply the film LUT. It's gonna do a better job if you apply it to the color image than to the black and white image. You're gonna get a more natural looking image. So that's gonna hand off here. It takes just a second because it's doing a whole bunch of AI under the hood. And while that's still running there, let's just let that finish. It's being, come on, it knows that the webinar is over, so I want to stop. But uh, there we go. Now it's off. And here it comes. Give it a second to think. And now all of the sky has been enhanced with Accent AI, removing the color cast in the clouds and adding detail. And it looks great. We'll add the color lookup table. Let's go with the simple film stock. And we'll try Fuji. That looks good. I like the little shift of pink there. That's actually evocative of the film. Add the black and white conversion. And there it is. Grab the on image tool. Pull down the blues. Great. Grab the greens and yellows. Lift. Pull. And so very quickly, you can target the different colors to get the separation that you want. That looks great. Let's finish it out, add a texture layer just by going to pattern here. 
A lot of folks don't know that there's actually good ones in here. And you can choose something like artist surfaces and find different canvas textures. Scale that up to taste and mix it in. Something gentle here like soft light at a low opacity just gives it the feeling of being printed on canvas. Now, add our curve, use the same on image tool, pull, pop, nailed it. And now I've got the type of black and white photograph I want. Texture, like paper, film stock emulation, and the contrast and dynamic range that makes it look like a great black and white. So I hope this gives you guys some ideas and shows you that you don't have to overthink. There is no shame in using those on image tools and those things that just target it so much faster so you don't have to sit there. I practically made zero selections today and I still got precise results. So thank you all for coming out. My name's Rich Harrington and uh, I appreciate that you guys invited me to come in and talk today. Thanks to Andrew and the rest of the group. And if you guys have any questions, I'll hang out in the chat pod here and answer a few questions. Thanks again. So if you have any questions, feel free to post them. And uh, the webinar and the demos portion is officially over, but I'm just gonna scroll through the questions here and make sure everything got asked, answered. So thanks guys. A lot of hellos, good to hear from you all. And that's good. Uh, Luminar right now is on sale for $20 off. That's a, a special that's running for about another two days. And there is a special there on getting Luminar and Aurora at the same time on the page. Uh, your, uh, upgrade your Mac to use Luminar. 32-bit sounds too labor-intensive. Well, I don't know how old your Mac is, but I would say download a trial version first and see what happens. Uh, you might have to be patient or you might not be able to run as many apps as I was running simultaneously, but it usually runs just fine. So uh, hopefully that helps. Uh, there's that price. So $119 to get Luminar and Aurora together as a special. So that's 50 bucks off, which would offset buying Photo Lemur. So it'd basically be getting Photo Lemur for free if you bought all three. Hope that helps. Uh, let's see here, 81% off with the link above for Photo Lemur. That's a pretty damn good deal too. Uh, yes, I do have a lot of LUTs. <laughs> I use them all the time. I make them all the time. If you take a look at Photo Focus, uh, I give some away there. And uh, the folks over at Skylum as well, if you visit their website and you just go to skylum.com, uh, besides free presets, if you go on into the Luminar Marketplace, what you'll see there is, let me just go to Marketplace. There we go. I clicked on the wrong link. You'll see LUTs. And so in here are some free LUTs. There's a couple that are premium, but here's a set of mine that are free. And here's a cool set from uh, Lutify that are also free. So two free sets that you can totally download at absolutely no cost. And these do work with, uh, they do work with Photoshop as well directly. So you're welcome to try some of those out. And these are just a couple of the treatments that are available. So feel free to explore. I hope you guys like that. And uh, let's see here to finish this off. Do the plugins have beginner training? Absolutely. And thank you. I'm glad you guys learned something. So uh, that's great. And this was recorded. So I will give Andrew a copy of the recording. And uh, I'm sure he'll get it posted. And that should also be in the video section on the group as well, if you want to miss, if you miss something or want to watch it again or share it with folks. I know I have a tendency to go a bit fast. Uh, that's because I get excited by all these tools. So feel free and take a look. Um, but hopefully you guys picked up some new techniques today. Thanks again. And uh, I'm going to end the broadcast. And thank you guys so much for coming out and uh, watching live. Or if you joined us on the replay, I hope you enjoyed it.